You know, it's great to celebrate our nation's freedom. And uh, it, Ocala, I, don't, I haven't quite figured it out yet if we are very, very patriotic or we just love to play with fire. Uh, being from, uh, yeah, I think it's a mix of both, right? Uh, so being from a larger city from Dallas, uh, you shoot a bunch of fireworks off there, you find yourself uh, staying in hotel jail. Uh, they will haul you off and strap those handcuffs on your wrists and get you out of there. And so it's, uh, it's really amazing to be able to live where we are. And, and our neighborhood turns into a bit of a war zone. Everyone just kind of pulls out your, your fireworks, big canisters, and you light that on fire and just goes off like crazy. And the whole, our whole neighborhood was just full of smoke. Uh, it, was, it was great. <laughs> uh, and thankfully, since it rained, uh, there's, no, there's no fires. So that's always, you know... Uh, I guess that little bit of adult responsibility in you says, okay, let's try not to start a fire. And so that was, that was really good. Uh, but you, did you know that there are some people out there that don't like the 4th of July? Yeah. You can boo if you want. <laughs> yeah. uh, they are communists and dogs. <laughs> dogs do not like the 4th of July. I uh, was doing a little research on running away this morning, and I found that More dogs run away on the 4th of July than any other day during the year. And can you blame them? I mean, really. Now think about this. If you're you're a canine, if you're a four-legged dog, and you are stuck in a house, and you keep hearing explosions going off all around the place, flashes of light, you just go crazy. You're chasing your circle and, and panicked. You don't know what in the world is going on and what mom and dad are doing with all the fire and fireworks and all that. So... Uh, a lot of dogs will run away on the 4th because they just go, they go crazy. You know, uh, there's a lot of costs associated with dogs running away. Uh, first of all, think about the owner anxiety. Uh, has anyone here ever lost a dog? And just the feeling that you have that you get just in, the, in your gut, you're just so full of, of fear and sadness and what happens if little Fluffy never returns? And you could joke about it, but it's, it's, it's very sad stuff. Uh, you might print flyers, you go to the local uh, FedEx or uh, wherever it may be, and you print up a whole bunch of flyers, and you post that all around the neighborhood and, and all the time that goes into it. Uh, maybe you get some neighbors to help and kind of canvas the area, the last place the dog was seen, and, and everyone's uh, burning a lot of gas. And You know, it, it turns out that even just a few days ago, uh, we had a, a friend in Leeward uh, who, uh, whose dog ran away. And uh, they even enlisted helicopters to go search for the dogs. And can you blame them? I mean, if, you're, if you've got a neighbor who drives a, a helicopter, why not? And so that dog made it uh, all the way to Bellevue. And thankfully, they found it and was really exciting and answered a prayer and all that. Uh, but I do mention that, that running away has significant costs. And, and when you think about what, what happens when a dog runs away, and we, we, you understand that. Like, we, we, we get it. Uh, it causes us all kinds of, of, of pain, and, and we're afraid of losing the dog. We're, we're spending money. We're really chasing after the dog. Uh, what happens when, when people run away? Uh, when people run away from God, our Heavenly Father. And what happens when we turn our back on Him and leave? And, and that's exactly what Jonah uh, did last week when we looked at it. But this is not a time where we sit and we analyze all of Jonah's mistakes. This is a time that we come before the Lord in humility and prayer and ask God, what do you have for me in this story? What do you have for me in God's word? It's, it's, so it's an, an important question to ask. Are you running away from God? Uh, are you fleeing from him, from his presence? Or anything that he is leading you to do? And the two are linked. Because when God asks us to do something, like he asked Jonah to go to Nineveh, and he refused, it was not only a lost mission, but also a broken relationship. And so, very important questions for us. Are we running away from God, or are we fleeing from him, or anything he's requiring us to do, anything he's asking or leading us to do, no matter how hard it may be? So we're going to be looking at that uh, uh, in uh, Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, and, and, and four, uh, three costs of what happened when we run from God. As we looked at last week, the book of Jonah, author is unknown, although it's likely that Jonah had significant contributions to the book because there's things in the book that only he would know, although it is written in the third person. The date of these events is about 760 BC. The audience was the northern kingdom of Israel. 
and the purpose, this really illustrates God's grace towards unlikely recipients. And we'll see this over and over and over, God's amazing grace to all people in every way. And I uh, just really want to focus on grace every time that we see it. Last week, I asked the, the children to submit drawings of Jonah, and I want to share these with you. These are some great stuff. We have some excellent artists out there. Uh, so I uh, want to show you a few of those pictures here. We have uh, Jonah with a backpack, and so maybe he's storing some scrolls in the back, and he's, he's ready to go. Uh, we've got your classic prophet pose, long bearded, uh, got the cane, and he, he's, he's ready to go to proclaim a message. And then we've got uh, the shaven happy Jonah on the right. Uh, here you've got stick figure Jonah, and he might be flying. I don't know. But uh, very cool. Here we have uh, a very happy, smiling Jonah. And I think that was a fish actually right next to him. So he's, he's getting ready to say hello to the fish. Uh, here you've got VeggieTale Jonah on the left, uh, because he has no arms and no legs. Uh, he also has no mouth. That's a very good theological observation, because Jonah was not prophesying. That's what he's supposed to do. Got some great theologians in there. Uh, we also have uh, a very outgoing Jonah. Hi, my name is Jonah. And if you can see it, uh, over to his right is Jose. And so you get a bonus drawing. I think we have a very astute artist in here who is saying that's Hosea, who is a contemporary of Jonah. And so uh, maybe you get a bonus Jonah plus Hosea there. You've got a wet Jonah over here, sopping wet. And then uh, we have, uh, yay God, Jonah. And then uh, what, did, what did our children learn last week? Our children learned that Jonah was messed up. That's what, we got, that's what we learned from last week. Jonah's very messed up. And so uh, he's a lot like us, right? Yeah, he's a lot like us. There's a lot of parallels there between Jonah and us. And then uh, in the little parentheses it says, but he was forgiven by God. So it's a good message to have. He was messed up, but God forgave him. And so this week, children, we'd like for you to draw a picture of the storm that we're going to describe. We're talking about a ferocious storm, and I'd, I'd love to have your creativity Think about all the lightning and the wind and the rain and the waves and all that. Draw a, a ferocious storm and maybe uh, the boat kind of being tossed about in that. So I uh, would love for, uh, to have pictures of, of the storm. So what happens when we run from God? What happens when we run from God? Uh, the first thing that happens is calamity. We see this in verse 4. The Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And so uh, the first thing that happens is there's a great wind, a great wind. It says that the Lord, uh, and the, in the Hebrew it says the, the Lord hurled the storm. And so you get this, this, this whole picture of, of Jonah's trying to escape, and God just zaps him with the wind. And I, this is just mind-blowing to me, just the fact that God did not kill Jonah. If I were reading the book of Jonah for the first time, I would expect the book of Jonah to, to, to have four verses in it. Here's the, prophet, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jonah. Go to Nineveh and proclaim against it. Jonah ran away. And then God smiteth the wayward prophet from the face of the earth. That's, I, I would expect it to be four verses long. But it was not. God did not kill Jonah. Jonah, great is his long sufferingness and his patience towards his children and his people. And the more that we read in this book and the more mistakes Jonah makes, the more just his grace towards Jonah should be mind-blowing to us. And he has grace on a wicked people like the Ninevites. He has grace with the wicked prophet. But not only did God not kill Jonah, he pursued Jonah. See, God just could have let Jonah run his own way. He could have just left him to be. He could have let him sail across the sea, and, and God doesn't need Jonah. He could have had anyone go over there and proclaim a message of, of judgment upon Nineveh. He's God. He can do whatever he wants, but yet God chose to pursue Jonah. Jonah's li Jonah might have thought his life and his career were over, but God said, not so. I'm going to pursue you. I'm not going to let you get away from me. And ultimately, just such was the love that God had for Jonah and the grace that God had for Jonah. And just think about the offense that, that Jonah uh, made towards God. God said, God commanded Jonah. 
God's word spoke to Jonah, and yet Jonah defied the living God, the holy God, all-powerful, the one that created the land and the sea and, the, and all that we see around us. And, and God shook his, Jonah took, shook his face, shook his fist in the face of God. And yet God spared him. He pursued him. He loved him. And this wind was a fierce wind, a strong wind. And it, 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 it threw a violent storm. Uh, have you been caught in a violent storm before? Yeah. You know, I think it's really important that when we read things like this, that we really stop and consider. I consider the, the fiercest, worst storm you've ever been a part of. We had, a, we had a little bit of a storm, actually, on the 4th. And even that, just the thunder and, and the rain was enough to drive us out of our barbecue and back inside. It really makes you feel kind of helpless when you're in the midst of a violent storm because there's just really not much you can do. You know, what can stop a lightning bolt? Well, let's look at the elements here that Jonah and the ship would have faced. Now, first of all, there's a fierce wind, a strong wind, powerful wind. And I just think about the times that I've been out and, and a strong gust of wind has just about lifted me off the ground. It'll make you feel so powerless, this kind of wind that'll blow over fences, and, and it really renders you helpless. Uh, this wind would have caused havoc with the ship, would have redirected it. It would have been lost in the wind. Uh, think about the pouring rain. Uh, this fierce storm, the rain would have been coming down in sheets. It would have been strong. If you're driving and, and, and you come to a point where you just can't see in front of the car, you've got to stop. That's the idea. The, the rain that limits your visibility in pounds is coming down relentlessly. Uh, the lightning strikes that are coming once over here, once over there. You just, you, 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 you see the flash of light and then you count until you hear the thunder and the thunder just shakes your very being. All the lightning strikes that have been going on around this ship. The pounding waves. The, the strength of the storm. And how you could have these massive waves that would come and break over a ship. This was a an awe-inspiring, fear-inducing storm, a ferocious storm. Again, picture the most ferocious storm you've ever, ever been a part of, and it's probably a lot worse than that. So when God sent the wave, he sent the storm. It rendered the ship powerless. There's nothing that they could do. Uh, so let's talk about the ship. The ship began to break. It's interesting, and in the, uh, the, the Hebrew language says that the ship threatened to break up. And so it's, it's almost like a personification of the ship. And so you, you hear the ship talking in a way. How do you hear the ship talking? Well, have you, have you uh, been around a place where uh, you've had timbers and you hear those timbers groan and you could hear the, the pressure of the waves, the pressure of the, the wind pushing on the sides of the ship and you hear the timbers groan under the, under the weight and under the duress, you might hear a little bit of the creaking noise. And so it's almost like at any given moment, this, this mass is going to snap or these, the, the ship's going to turn into a, a pile of, of matchsticks. It's just going to blow to pieces. You might have that creaking. Uh, maybe there's a leaking involved. And so you have a situation where the water starts to flood in in the middle of the ship. And maybe you see a rolling uh, and so you see a rolling of the ship. Uh, and think about that. You're, you're in this merchant ship going from side to side and being tossed, tossed around by the waves. And then not only in addition to rolling, you also have the dipping of the ship. The bow might, uh, you might have the breakers just sweep over the bow of the ship and, and threaten to, to ruin it. And so just picture what it must have been like to be a sailor on that ship, or what it must have been like to be Jonah on the ship. This is a ferocious storm. Would have pushed them to do things that are far beyond what they normally would do. Would have really been putting them out of their comfort zone. Uh, it brings us to a question. Could Jonah outrun God? No. It was foolhardy. In fact, as we read the story right now, a lot of us would just think, how crazy would you have to be to think that you could outrun God? to flee from the presence of the one who made all things, to flee from the presence of the one who made us. And yet this is something that we're tempted to do also. Uh, we, we are tempted to try to outrun God. 
Maybe things don't go our way, and we're very disappointed by something that happens in, in church, or, or our prayers aren't answered the way that we want them to be answered, or, or maybe we've sinned a whole bunch and we're afraid to go and, and beg forgiveness from God. We don't think His grace would extend to such as us, and so we have this idea that we're going to run away from God. We're going to run away from church, run away from our family and fellowship, and run away from the Bible and Scripture, and, and so we run, and we run, and we run, and we try to put that behind us, and and we're spiritual but not religious, and we stay at home, and, and we just kind of lose our, our purpose, we lose our mission. And it seems like a good idea at the time. It seems like, I don't want any, when these things don't go our way, it seems like we should be running away from God. Like, he, he has no interest in us, therefore we're just going to do our own thing. And so even though we look at Jonah, we look at the foolishness there, it's something that we are absolutely guilty of ourselves if we're not careful. This idea of outrunning God, we can't do it. And when we try to outrun God, God loves us too much to leave us, to leave his children. So he brings a calamity. And calamity forces us to our knees, into the strong arms of the God who loves us. And even though calamity comes whenever we, we run away from God, sometimes God just brings calamity to help us develop. I was watching a, a documentary on Right Now Media uh, of, of Steve Saint and and he was sharing about his accident and how he had such a rough life. How not only did he lose his, his father in the mission field, but he lost a daughter also. And then, uh, just a few years ago, uh, he was doing an experiment trying to help uh, a flying car that would be helpful and beneficial to the indigenous people. Uh, and, it, and the safety harness broke and, and it almost severed his spine. And he went through immense pain and he wrote a poem. And he's talking about how the thorn is a gift a thorn is a gift that takes away the veil so we can more clearly see God's face. And see, calamity, whether or not it's we're running away from God or whether or not we're, we're running towards God, calamity forces us into prayer. And nothing can do that like, like the difficulties and the trials. And we've got a decision when calamity hits us. Do we go to our knees and go to the one that loves us or do we run? When God brings the storms, he brings the valleys, and brings the financial hardships, and brings the, the health struggles and relationships that are, that are just being destroyed or ripped apart, what are we going to do? What are we going to do in the situations? God intends to use this to restore his people to him, not to drive them away. And so when we run from God, we'll see calamity. We will also see collateral damage, collateral damage. And before we even read verse 5, I want to talk about who's not mentioned in this verse. And it's a very important observation as far as who's not mentioned. The Ninevites aren't mentioned. See, God called Jonah to a very important mission. You're to go to this wicked city and proclaim that if they don't change their ways, they're going to be destroyed. And who's preaching to them? Who's looking after them? What's happening there? This is a mission failure. And so... In, in, in abandoning his mission, Jonah is needed. He's needed in Nineveh. And yet he denies that. He rejects that. And these Ninevites aren't going to hear the message of God's grace. Well, let's read about the sailors in verse 5. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Okay, just picture in your mind this storm, this ferocious storm that's engulfing the ship, and, and how do the sailors respond? Well, first, it's important to note that these are professional sailors. This is a merchant ship, probably a Phoenician ship. These would be the best sailors in the world at the time. This is what they did all the time. Uh, and so this is their ship. They knew it well. They are professionals. You know, think of uh, uh, the tough guys of, of our day. So maybe those in a motorcycle bunch, that are all tattooed up, or the really the strong guys that, that you don't want to mess with. And, and so these, these, these uh, sailors would have been professional. They would have been ripped. They would have been working on the, the masts all day. They would have been rowing the ship. They'd be strong men, men that show no weakness. And they're terrified. They are absolutely terrified. And it's something like a storm comes into our life when we realize how powerless we are. These, these, uh, these professional soul, uh, sailors have come to the point where they realize that they are completely and totally powerless. And they did everything they could. 
It wasn't enough, and so it left them to cry out to their gods, kind of the last resort. And so to whatever family gods, whatever, whatever gods of the city that there were, they were crying out, bellowing out on their knees, begging the gods to save them. Why are they going through this? You might feel like they're just unlucky. Some wayward punk prophet happened to board their ship. That's so unfair. Of all the ships that, that, that Jonah could have boarded, it was this unlucky crew that, that got it. it just, it's so frustrating. And, and almost like when, when we have disobedience, when, when we run away from God or run away from God's mission for us, just the, the kind of collateral damage, it's just, it just tough. And we don't do what we're supposed to do. And the people around us suffer for it. And so here these poor sailors are just beside themselves and lost. And so what do they do? They lighten the ship. And, and the purpose of lightening, of lightening uh, the ship would be that, uh, again, as the ship would roll and dip back and forth, that the waves would be going crashing over the ship. And, and, uh, and so they would try to uh, make the ship lighter so it would ride higher on the water, be less likely that they would be swamped and drowned. This was not something that they would do lightly. This is a last resort. It says that they dumped cargo overboard. What kind of cargo would, might they have been dumping? Uh, all kinds of util, utensils. Uh, so anything that was not absolutely necessary. Their baggage, provisions for the long journey, the food and water, uh, merchandise. They would have been carrying probably wine and, and oil and big jugs, and they would have been tossing everything overboard, anything that had weight, and desperation. Because... And, and they, they're going to lose their livelihood in all this. So, so think about it. As, as you're dumping all the stuff that you own over the side, they're losing all this money. And they might, uh, when, when they uh, pull into the port, if they pull into the port, they're going to get an earful from their bosses. And they might never be able to, to sail again. And, and so they're losing all this money and, and all this hope. They're, they're just trying to make it. They've also lost their mission. Uh, this trip from... Uh, Joppa over to Tarshish probably lasts at least a year. And so they've been planning for a long time for this trip. And so they would have lost months, if not years, of their lives in all of this. And so uh, this, the sailors are panicking. They're afraid. Um, think about uh, today, what it would be like if, if your house would catch on fire. Or in any kind of, of ca ca uh, catastrophic situation. You get yourself and you get out of there. Uh, and, and all the stuff can be replaced at some time later. Or maybe some of it can't be replaced, but life is precious and must be preserved. And so the, these soldiers are, these sailors are in uh, life preservation mode, jettisoning everything. All this because the wayward prophet was running from God. Is there collateral damage today? when we might not do the mission that God has called us to do. We don't take God's word seriously when it tells us to share the gospel, to love others, to forgive, to serve. The world needs salt and light. And Jesus said we're the salt of the earth. We're the preservative force. We're the, we're the light of the world. And outside of Christ is darkness. And when we do not follow God's will, God's word, there's serious problems. The world needs salt and light. I mean, just a quick survey of all the news today, all the hate, all the fighting, all the foolishness, all the misplaced hope. God has called us to be salt and light into this world. Who will love the widows and orphans? And God has called us to serve and to love the less fortunate. I love the Women's Pregnancy Center, and I'm really, I really appreciate the, the fundraiser. Who's going to love the woman who gets pregnant outside wedlock and gets disowned? Who's going to love them? And James 1.27 says that pure religion is this, to love widows and orphans. And will we? There's a real, there's a real problem. The world needs us and needs Christians to stand up and to do what God's told us to do, to not run away. And who will share the gospel if we don't? 
And just like I, I picture and I think about the Ninevites who they needed to know God's grace. They needed to know, they needed to be warned. Who's going to share the gospel if we don't? Who's going to tell this world who's trying to find satisfaction in anything but Jesus that they can have forgiveness and peace and meaning and hope and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? There's serious collateral damage today if we duck and run from God. And there's calamity, there's collateral damage. There's also a lot of confusion when we run from God. And think about the sailors, and think about the storm, think about the ship and all that's going on. Where's Jonah? We see in verse 5, but Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. What is Jonah doing? What is going on here? Well, first we find out that he is below deck. And it would have been in a ship uh, like this, a Phoenician merchant ship, that they would have had uh, uh, a sail and a mast, and they, were, they would row also, and they would have a, a hold, a place where all the sailors could sleep. And so Jonah, having paid his fare and, and, and uh, paid for passage across the sea, would have been, he, he must have gone downstairs and gone to sleep. He was below deck. He was not above deck helping. He was down below deck being comfortable. Uh, he had laid down. He was not active. Uh, he was useless. Uh, he was not being helpful in any way. And he was laying down. He wasn't even praying laying down. He was doing nothing. He was in a deep, deep sleep. Uh, we're, we're confronted with a bit of a problem here. Think about the way that the, the, the ship would have been groaning and creaking and swaying back and forth and, and all the seasoned professional sailors would have been puking and they would have been running for their lives and stirring around and crying out, how could Jonah have been asleep? How could he have been sleeping? Well, there's a few possibilities. One is that he was so exhausted from running from God, so exhausted from fighting God, that he just simply fell into a deep, deep, almost coma-like state. He might have been to the point of depression and in such despair that he did not care what happened to him, that he was going to rest, and if darkness overtook him and he died, he was okay with that. Uh, had a professor that, thinks, that thought that uh, he might have also taken, uh, taken some of that wine and the cargo, and he might have, that might have taken him out. And so we don't know if he was drugged or if he was in despair or exhausted, but Jonah's in a whole different world. Not, not in the real world, in a dream world. Did you see the, the faith of the captain? Isn't that amazing? The captain and, and the sailors are in this frantic mode trying to dump stuff overboard and pray to their gods and, and do anything he can to preserve the life. And, and he says, uh, in the Septuagint translation, says, how can you be snoring? How can you snore? Now you know Jonah had to be snoring aloud if you heard it over the storm. He must have really been out. And so the captain says, how can he be snoring? How can he be sleeping? This is unheard of. Do you have no regard for your life? Does it mean nothing to you? Because we're going to die here. Get up and pray to your God. Uh, do, you, do you care about anyone else? Uh, do you care about anyone else in this ship? And so uh, Jonah was showing zero regard for his own life, zero regard for others. And, and, and think about this, this. What a contrast. The prophet's not praying. Like, if you'd want anyone on that ship to be with you, to pray for you, it would be a prophet, a prophet of God, someone who has direct access to the Lord, who speaks to the Lord. And here you have a prophet, and all he has to do, I'm convinced, is just simply say a word to God, and God would calm that storm. All he has to do is pray and admit that it's, it's foolhardy to run away from God. The prophet is not praying, and this, uh, this captain has such faith. He says, call on your God. He's going, I believe that there's a good chance that if he, if he hears you, he's going to save us. The captain knew that Jonah was running from God because he'd already told him, we find out in verse 10. Call in your God. See, there's such confusion when a prophet doesn't do what God commands him to do. It's real confusion. 
There's real confusion when a Christian does not do what they're supposed to do. A while back, there was a, a famous video clip, and I'll post it on our, on our website. Uh, anyone ever heard of Penn and Teller? They're a world-famous uh, magician act over in Vegas and very atheist, very far from God. And it was about 10 years ago that he was talking about a man who came up to him after a show and gave him a Gideon Bible and said, hey, I'm, I want to share my faith with you. I know you're an atheist, but I'm not crazy. I'm a businessman. I just want you to have the hope that I have. How would you think that Penn would respond? Here you've got this professional talker and magician who's, who's a somebody, and here you've got a nobody that comes to him and says, hey, you should follow Jesus. Here's a guy that prides himself on atheism. And he says, not only do I, do I not think there's a, like, I'm certain there's not a God. That's what, what Penn says. Penn was very impressed. He was very impressed by this man. And he began to think about it. He, think, he, he was thinking that this businessman who came and shared his faith with me, that's worth something. That's exactly what he should be doing. And he, he took it a step further. He, th- he thought, well, why don't I hear from more Christians? And he takes it a step further, and here's a quote from him. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that, to have such indifference towards those people around us? It's confusing to Penn. It's confusing to the world. He uses the analogy of if... He said uh, later on in the clip, he said that if I knew there's a truck that was bearing down on your position, I'm going to run and I'm going I'm to level you and get you out of the way. How much would you have to hate someone to watch them go to their death unchallenged? This is confusing to the world. There's a, a couple reasons. Because if we're not sharing our faith, do we really believe it? Do we really believe the gospel? That all of us deserve damnation. There is no one perfect. And we stand before a holy and perfect and powerful God. And there's nothing we can do to make things right. And we deserve hell. And that's our situation. But God in his great love for us sent his son to die for us simply by trusting in him and trusting his forgiveness, we can have eternal life. How can we believe that and not share it? We should wake up every morning just full of joy and enthusiasm, knowing that God loves us. This world may be falling to pieces, and our lives may be falling to pieces, our bodies falling to pieces, but God loves us, and our eternal destiny is in heaven with him. No fear, no pain, no trials, no sickness, no lies, no wars, no despairs, that is amazing. And that should drive us. And how can, we, how can we not share that? Do we really believe it? This is the most important thing, and it's not even close. What are we going to compare the gospel to? How much stuff we own? What people think about us? How healthy we are? This is amazing. That Jesus has saved us, and we have life in him. And and the non-Christian, the atheist, sees the Christian life and sees a heart of indifference as someone who just shows up to church on Sunday morning or or doesn't show up at all, and, and they're just the same as them. There's nothing special there. Do we really believe it? Are we transformed by it? But if we do believe it, if we don't care about anyone else but us. And so we we look at the people around us, and and just like Jonah, who's in this world of comfort, he was in a deep sleep in a fantasy realm, and all he had to do was pray. And yet he was content to just just sleep asleep indefinitely. And so often the Christian church is guilty of this, of, of sleeping while the world around us is going to hell. And God has so much more in mind for us than that. He wants to use us. And this book of Jonah, the, the whole Bible, is, is a spur to get us, to, to get us out of complacency, and to, to help us to work up the courage to, to reach out a hand to our lost friends and family and neighbors. 
Do we really care about those around us? Because if we do, we're going to do something. Doing nothing is not an option. If we believe the gospel and we love other people, we will share the gospel. And we need regular reminders of that. Just think about the magnificence of our mission. God could have, when we became Christians, he could have just taken us up to heaven. And really, that would be best for all of us, right? Because we'd just be in Jesus' presence, worshiping him. But he gave us a mission. Jesus' last words to his church, to his people, therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. What an amazing message that is. What a magnificent mission that God uses us, and we're just like Jonah. And God uses flawed people like us, flawed Christians like us, and says, I'm going to use you to build my church. You can go and make disciples of all nations. And here in America, all nations have come to us, so we don't have to go anywhere almost. And we get to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God, and we get to see life transformations. We get a baptism here in a couple weeks, and I'm so excited. And we get to baptize others. We get to play a part in this. Uh, But then not just simply to accept Christ, but to teach, to disciple, to learn, to dig deep into Scripture and understand the message that God has for us. He calls us to teach everything that he's commanded. What an incredible mission that is. It's worth dying for. It's worth living for. And we've got to keep our eyes on that. So what are the next steps for us? We come from a variety of backgrounds this morning. Uh, Some of us are lock in step with what God wants for us. I think all of us can do better. Thankfully, there's grace. But are you running from God? If you are, stop running. Maybe it's not so much that you're running from God, you're still reading your Bible, you're still praying. Uh, Maybe you need to stop running away from what he's called you to do. There's some people across the street that don't look like you don't act like you. Maybe they don't celebrate the 4th of July and they need to hear about Jesus. People that are different from us. Stop running away from God. Stop running away from the mission that he has for us. And pray for direction. Um, We can be on our knees before the Lord and ask God, at this stage of life, what would you have me do? I believe that God has put each one of us exactly where we are for a reason. Ephesians 2.10 that says that we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. What good works is God calling you to? What are the things that he's put right in front of you, that, uh, an incredible mission uh, that only you can fulfill? What is, what's in front of you? Pray for God to reveal how he can use you. Pray for direction. And then ask God for opportunities that God would give openings to share the gospel. If, you're, if you want to reach out to your neighbors, you feel like God has, has put you where you are for a reason, uh, maybe it's just simply just praying that you'd be checking the mail at the same time or that, that somehow that there just would be an opening where you could, you could uh, share the gospel. And then when we think about all this, it could be overwhelming, right? And so the challenge, take a next step. Just take a next step. We're not going to solve everything on one Sunday. We're not going to solve everything in a week or even the Jonah series. What we can do is take a step in the right direction. For those those of us that are actively running away from God or running away from from what he's called us to do, it's a matter of stopping and maybe turning around and just begin to walk in the other direction. Pray, God, what would you have me do? Why am I here? Why did you call me to Ocala? What What do you want to do through me? What do you want to do through my family? And then praying for opportunities and, and taking those next steps. Uh, it's such a, just a great reminder. Uh, last week, we looked at 2 Corinthians 5, 20. want to look at that again. Um, that we are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so here you have Paul modeling for us what we need to be doing to others. Is imploring them to be reconciled to God. But all this is possible, all this makes sense, all this has any meaning whatsoever because of the next verse. God made him 
who had no sin, to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so even though uh, we are full of sin, no one's, no one's perfect, we all have flaws, we all are just like Jonah, all of us, our inclinations is to run away from God and, and take the easy route and to live in our comfort zones, that's all of us. And God made his son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might have fellowship with God, we might be reconnected with God, that God would, would rescue us and take us to be with him where he is. The words that we've said, the, the words that we've sung this morning, uh, just can in no way describe your majesty, what you mean to us, the hope that we only have in you. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to see you, to live for you, to see the urgency of the mission that you've called us on, to understand that you've given us this life for a reason and that's to serve you, to love you, to know you, to, to tell others about you. Lord, we pray that as we experience calamities, whether it be self-induced or something you just bring in our lives to drive us to our knees, Lord, I pray that, that you would call us to yourself, that in our, in our weakness we would be made aware of our our struggles and be made aware of our need for you. We would not run from you in bitterness or despair. We'd run towards you. We'd find healing in you for all of the pain that we experience, all the agony that we go through, Lord. This is a broken world full of pain and despair. Please give us peace in the midst of calamity. Lord, I pray that we'd be men and women who'd be faithful to your mission. That in our, in our disobedience, we would not cause collateral damage to others, but that we would be your hands and feet that you've designed us to be. And when the world looks at us and sees us, Lord, they see Christians, those that belong to you, those who have given their hearts to you, those that live for you. Do not live for dual purposes. We're not in love with the world and in love with you. That you are our God and our Savior to whom we owe all things. So Lord, as we consider this story of Jonah, Lord, I pray that you would create in us hearts that are nothing like that. That we would embrace whatever call that you've given us, no matter the cost, we would follow you. We live for you. We believe that you have great things in store for each one of us. You've, you have us here for a reason. We pray that you'd use us to serve the city, love the city, do great things right here where you've planted us, and you'd use us to impact here and all across the world because you are a great God, and you can do it in your power. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends, fellow family, such a privilege to be able to come before you uh, on a Sunday morning and worship God together and study his word and truly hope that you've been encouraged and blessed by what the book of Jonah says. Fellow ambassadors, fellow partakers in the grace of God, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, Jesus says, I am with you, always to the very end of the age. God bless you. Have a great week.